much to Neva for inviting me to speak on this panel. It's really an honor. So I'm going to very briefly survey the existing regulation at the international level. Um, two preliminary comments about that. First of all, this survey will be very partial and selective. Uh, the regulation is fractured, it's a patchwork, maybe a patchwork of band-aids, so there is a lot, and obviously I can't present a lot, and there's no point in, in 15 minutes, so I, I chose what I uh, considered the most important and most relevant norms. Um, and I'm only going to talk about international law, there is a lot of regulation, of course, at the domestic level, um, but I'm, I'm focusing on international law, and part of that choice uh, is based on the understanding that to regulate uh, this, this topic, you need harmonization at the international level given the possibilities of international uh, arbitrage. So that's one preliminary um, comment. The second comment is that this won't be 100% descriptive. I'm going to describe at first different uh, pieces of this fractured regulation. And then at the bottom of each slide, towards the bottom, you will see text in red. And that's uh, my uh, assessment of the strengths and mostly weaknesses of the existing uh, regulation. And the reason I'm doing this is that I think the, the point of uh, this presentation is not just to give background, but to understand what is out there, what is not working or seems to not be working, and what has potential, what we could perhaps build on. So of course, you know, the parts in red are my opinions. We can debate each of these for hours, but I'm just throwing these out there to be uh, a basis for a discussion. Um, so uh, first of all, it's important to note that um, cyber surveillance tools, and that's how I'm going to call, you know, there are different terms, uh, offensive cyber, spyware, I'm going to call uh, this uh, cyber uh, surveillance tools, are categorized in a number of regulatory regimes as a dual use item or dual use technology. Um, very briefly, dual use uh, category, that's a category that has developed in the law and the regulation alongside weapons as an object of regulation. Um, originally in the context of chemical and nuclear technologies, um, there are different definitions. Some instruments don't even define the term. Uh, they just list uh, what they consider um, dual use. Generally, it can mean um, an item that can have both military and civil uses, okay, that or or harmful and peaceful uses as in nuclear uh, technology, or more generally, we can think of a proper or improper use, okay? And I think this is sort of, this reflects the two stories that Juan Bergman has given us now, right? He told us the story of improper use and then of a proper one. Um, so how does international law generally relate to weapons and dual use items? And, 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 International law sometimes puts those two together. So, first of all, at one end, on the sort of extreme end, for technologies that are considered particularly destructive or cruel, there are bans. Okay, bans on use, on production, and and on transfer. Not all of these. I've listed a number of treaties here. Um, there's a, the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Um, protocols to the convention on prohibiting certain conventional weapons uh, that prohibits uh, certain actions with respect to blinding laser weapons, incendiary weapons, certain kinds of, of mines. Um, not all of these are absolute bans. In some treaties, you're banned from transferring the item to a state that is not party uh, to the treaty or to a non-state actor, but generally the, the idea is this is these are horrible, very scary technologies. We're just stopping or severely limiting uh, their production use and transfer. Okay, so this is just a sample of the, the treaties. There are many more. There is no such prohibition on cyber surveillance tool, and neither is there on small arms and autonomous weapons. And the reason I mentioned small arms and autonomous weapons is that there are many discussions 
um, about including these in, in this category or extending uh, a ban or ban-like uh, regulation uh, to these categories. So for we weapons deemed conventional that are, uh, you know, international law allows you to trade under the Arms Trade Treaty, uh, which was signed in 2013, came into force only in 2014, so it's still recent. Um, we have a prohibition of transfers, okay, for example, certain tanks, certain, uh, certain very conventional weapons. Prohibition if at the time of um, authorization, you need a license to export these items. If at the time of authorization, the exporting state knows that they will be used in the commission of genocide or other grave atrocities. And then for the bulk of the weapons, there's a human rights assessment. And you have to weigh the risks that certain uh, human rights will be uh, affected. And um, so this, this is considered you know, the latest word, the highest standard on human rights protection uh, in, the, in the field. It's not applicable to cyber surveillance tools, and there's no way of interpreting it otherwise. The conventional weapons that it's, it applies to are very clearly listed. Its effectiveness is questionable for a number of reasons, but it's still in its early days. Um, okay, so besides those specific um, norms, we have general obligations under international human rights law. So these are obligations that apply to states. Uh, that are very wide and that in theory should severely limit the trade in cyber surveillance tools. Okay, we have uh, obligations on states to respect pr and protect uh, in very extensive ways life, liberty, privacy, freedom of expression, of association, etc. All of the rights that are affected in all of the stories we hear about Pegasus and other cyber surveillance tools. And I, I just want to say here, just, just so it's said at one point, I mean, I'm using, I'm, I'm, uh, I was presented as a constitutional law scholar. I'm, I specialize in international human rights law as well. And though my perspective here in the evaluative part of my presentation focuses on human rights, uh, when I say human rights, I'm not just talking about this list of, uh, of rights here, life, liberty, privacy, etc. When we think about the harms that uh, uh, Pegasus and other cyber surveillance tools do through these infringements of rights, what we're talking about is concentration of power okay, and severe uh, harm to democracy okay, because this, these tools help um, individual rulers or uh, regimes concentrate power. And that comes out very clearly if you watch the excellent documentary, The Dissidents, about the murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi. So there's, of course, that horrible murder, but you see there that beyond the murder, there's, there's a concentration of power. So there's an obligation on the part of states to respect those rights. That obligation has been interpreted by um, uh, most bodies interpreting international human rights law as extending to individuals who uh, are beyond the borders of the states under different conditions, there are disputes, etc., but we're definitely no longer limited by national borders. And it's also very clear under international human rights law that the state is responsible for the actions of private actors who are operating within its jurisdiction, including corporations. And that that responsibility is not just in correcting uh, harms, but also preventing them. Okay, so you could put all of this together, okay, and build a coherent argument that uh, due to all of this, states are prohibited or very restricted in, in uh, when they authorize, when they act as the regulator uh, doing export control. Um, but this requires assembling a puzzle. It took me a few minutes to say all of this. And um, it helps for enforcement and for legal argumentation when things are said more explicitly as in these norms here, right? Where you say cluster munitions, banned, okay? Um, there are no strong enforcement mechanisms. This is not directly applicable to corporations. 
in theory, this already applies to states, and they're not they're not enforcing them uh, well enough. So um, I don't want to say you know give up completely on this avenue, but uh, this is out there, and it it's very relevant to what we're talking about, and it has not limited um, uh, the um, the export of cyber surveillance tools. We have non-binding international regimes, and I'm just going to talk about two. <coughs> The first one is the Wassenaar Arrangement on Export Controls uh, for both conventional arms and dual-use goods and technologies. Um, this arrangement, it's, uh, it's not legally binding, it's not a treaty, it's a voluntary uh, uh, arrangement among today 42 states, including almost all of the EU, including uh, the United States, some states in South America, uh, and in Asia. Um, and it involves two things, mostly agreeing on lists of items, it's just a very long document with lists of items that states should supervise, and generally what the supervision involves, I'll get to that second point. So you have a list of you know, tanks like this, and uh, since 2013, and more precisely 17, we have intrusion software and IP network surveillance systems. So some forms of cyber surveillance tools which are covered by that. So that means states have agreed in a non-binding manner, but they mostly uh, abide by it, that they will control the export of these items. And for uh, states that are parties to the arrangements, they exchange information on which which exports they have uh, refused or agreed to so that one state can know that the other, you know, a company is involved in, uh, in arbitrage. The problem with this, and it, it, the problem for me is not that it's not binding, um, you know, sometimes states have uh, incentives to comply better with binding norms. We saw the international human rights law is binding um, and it's not complied with, so there might be incentives to comply here. The problem is that the guidelines to states, and also I forgot to mention um, the uh, committees in the Wassenaar arrangements also have lists of questions for industry to ask themselves before entering into a contract. Um, they are very open-ended. It's very difficult to think of these as norms. They're questions, okay? Would this uh, sale destabilize regional uh, stability? Would it affect human rights? You know, it's questions, not norms, and it doesn't say what you should do if the answer to the question is yes. And it's like the like the human rights assessment under the um, sorry the arms trade treaty. It's a risk assessment model. So there's no bright line. States. Uh, it depends on states having sufficient information, and we have terrible information problems, uh, despite the huge work that civil society organizations do. <coughs> States retain huge discretion about whether or not to uh, authorize an export, and in this field, often states have a, a strong incentive to, for diplomatic or other reasons, to authorize or even push uh, the exports. And they are not representing; it's not the human rights of their citizens that we're concerned with here. So uh, there's no one representing the potential victims on the other side. Um, and this can be seen in the EU dual use re uh, regulation that was recast in 2021 that applies um, this and makes it binding. Um, it, it is very broad, it's considered very progressive. It, it, it applies more broadly than the Wassenaar uh, uh, arrangement. So cyber surveillance items, even those that are not listed in the Wassenaar arrangements, are subject under some conditions to uh, to export control, and here there's it for our purposes. I think there's an interesting partnership that's envisioned between the state and corporations because part of the way that states are supposed to know about the risk of a human rights infringement is that um, corporations are under an obligation to report the results of their corporate due diligence and inform the states during the uh, export control procedure if anything has come up. So even this binding, broadened um, uh, regulation that applies Wassenaar is, does not have a bright line. There's no prohibition. There's a human rights risk. It's something states have to consider. Excuse okay. me. It's, it's conference. May I sit down? Yes. Uh, thank you. To the extent I have authority to. Um. <laughs>
Okay, so, um, uh, but of course this is, perhaps I'm being pessimistic, this was just recast in 2021, and we'll see how that works out. Very briefly, another very important and relevant non-binding international regime is uh, the regime of principles devised at the UN uh, by a professor from Harvard Business School, uh, John Ruggie, uh, called the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights from 2011. Uh, that have enjoyed a lot of prestige and have been integrated and uh, repeated in many, uh, um, copied in many uh, contexts. And some, uh, I understand that some uh, corporations involved in uh, producing and selling uh, cyber surveillance technologies uh, claim to abide by them. And so this is not binding, but it's very interesting. The, the way the corporate obligation to exercise human rights due diligence to, to check uh, the human rights impact of its activities and, and correct it, mitigate it, uh, compensate when there is a, a problem. This obligation is, um, is drafted here very broadly. There are, you can say there are three levels. You have to avoid causing an adverse human rights impact. You have to avoid contributing. So even if you're just you're a contributor indirectly contributing, okay, you're you're part of a a, a broader range of factors. You still have to uh, avoid that and correct. And here, this is I think this is uh, principle 13. You have to seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly directly linked to their operations, products, and or services by their business relationships even if the corporations have not contributed to those impacts. So if you have a business relationship with an actor um, who is, is uh, infringing human rights and you are able to prevent or mitigate it, you have to do so. The problem is these are very difficult to enforce. They are not enforced even when there is a complaints mechanism. Okay, the uh, OECD also has guidelines on business and human rights that basically, you know, into, incorporates, download, or, or, or copy uh, the UN uh, principles, and they've created national contact points um, in every OECD member state. There's one in, uh, in Israel, there are some in, in Europe, and they're operating, and a victim can file a complaint. And um, there have been complaints filed in the UK and in Germany against companies that produced and sold uh, um, cyber surveillance tools to Bahrain. And in the case of uh, the English uh, procedure, uh, the NCP, the National Contact Point, found that the corporation had failed to uh, um, conduct sufficient due diligence and nothing came out of it. Okay, there's actually no consequence to this. There's a treaty on business and human rights uh, that's being negotiated, um, and here also it has a very, it envisions, and don't worry, I will be done in a, in a few, just two minutes, the treaty on business and human rights, it's important to mention it, uh, it's in its third draft already. It envisions, first of all, the states uh, enacting legislation that requires corporations to conduct due diligence, human rights due diligence on their operations. And also uh, the, the main tool that it gives is victims uh, procedural tools to sue corporations uh, that have infringed or contributed to infringing human rights. So this is sort of an interna international regulation that aims to change stage regulation, but the point of all this regulation is that bottom-up victims could use civil courts and tort proceedings to, as a, we, and we can see civil proceedings also as a form of regulation, right, to, uh, to lead the corporations to, to compensate for their harms and perhaps uh, change their behavior. Uh, this will take time because it's a general uh, treaty, it's not specific for cyber surveillance, but it's something uh, to follow. So all of these uh, uh, mechanisms and others I have not mentioned uh, have been reviewed recently by various mandate holders specializing in human rights protection at the UN um, and have been found insufficient. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Human Rights and Terrorism, uh, Professor Finula Niayolaid, and I'm sorry, I don't pronounce, I never pronounce Irish names, 
uh, correctly. Um, she has issued a very interesting uh, uh, report with a very thorough survey of all of these issues and more. And her conclusion is, first of all, well, we shouldn't completely, uh, so this is very contrary to Ronen's points, uh, a ban is not out of the question. It should be considered, okay? But in the meantime, um, if we have to think about regulation, how would we regulate? So there are uh, two aspects to her regulation. The first is she uh, promotes regulation by design, meaning for uh, cyber surveillance tools to be even to be international human rights law compliant in the first place, okay, and to not be banned, they would need to comply with these four minimum design requirements. Okay, and I won't go through all of them, but basically uh, the idea here of the first uh, two is that you don't go for all the possibilities as default position. Okay, you start with uh, a smaller number, uh, a more limited number of, uh, of, of functions and only increase if this is uh, necessary. You have uh, mechanisms such as kill switches to stop them when, when harm is, uh, um, is uh, identified. And for the purposes of remedy and judicial uh, oversight and other forms of auditing, you need to have an indelible permanent uh, uh, record of what actions have been taken so it can be monitored. And more broadly beyond, so that's like the minimum. Above that, uh, basically, um, she's advocating for something similar to the Business and Human Rights Treaty, which is a legal obligation for states to conduct extensive due diligence. Okay, and that uh, obligation uh, is linked to the receipt, would be linked to the receipt of uh, export authorizations. And more than that, there would be a, uh, a provision in, the, in each domestic law that would say for surveillance manufacturers to operate and sell from the state's jurisdiction, they must agree to direct legal liability for their export uh, of surveillance technology unless they can demonstrate that they have exercised sufficient due diligence. Okay, so um, all of this, I haven't written, and I, this is really my last word, I haven't, you don't have a, a red line here at the bottom that shows the weaknesses of, of this proposal, but uh, I did highlight the word legal in, right, in red, sorry, and I, I just want to flag this as a potential point of discussion. These are hard legal obligations. And we have to think about, uh, in terms of incentives, what this does. And can we marry and combine different regulatory approaches together? Due, due diligence uh, works, you know, it requires transparency and cooperation. And the question is whether states, uh, sorry, corporations will agree to be transparent, to admit to their, uh, to their uh, mistakes, to make changes, to discuss with victims, if they have legal liability uh, for those same proceedings, proceedings afterwards. So we, we might have a conflict here uh, among the approaches and maybe a legal approach is less appropriate than one that really builds on corporate incentives. So that's a question. Thank you for listening and I hope I didn't take over time. Uh, you can uh, move to the slide before. So 